Thank you very much, Sue. Can everybody hear me okay? I hope that you can do. Um, so as Sue said, so I'm Chief Executive of the Insight Management Academy and up until May of this year I had previously worked as Insight Director at Barclays Bank um, where I've been an employee for over 20 years uh, and Insight Director for 10. So I'm going to speak to you this morning a little bit from a personal perspective about where I, the journey that I think that Insight has been on and where I think that it might go to next. So, um, Insight's role over the next 10 years, um, forgive me if there's a short delay while I move the slide on here, but I'm going to, to begin talking you through it. Um, just over 10 years ago, um, I read um, a really important uh, report, a report that had a, a big impact on my subsequent career. I joined Barclays Bank Graduate Leadership Programme and I'd worked in a number of strategic marketing roles before seeing the hidden value that lay in Barclays customer data and starting to take on roles which enabled me to analyse it and apply it to business problems. In 2004, I'd become Head of Customer Analysis for the Barclays Group and I'd just been appointed to head a combined analysis and market research unit when someone passed me a copy of this report called Customer Insight Management and Communication, written by two consultants, Steve Wills and Sally Webb. The report called on organisations to see Insight not as a service function, but as a strategic asset, and one which was uniquely placed to give an organisation competitive advantage through the application of data and intelligence. To that end, the report advocated a shift in emphasis from Insight generation to Insight management and communication a recommendation which really resonated with me as I had seen at first hand that a great insight poorly communicated would sink without trace, whereas a fair insight brilliantly communicated could spread like wildfire. I also recognise the distinction which the authors made between insights, plural, key discoveries about consumers or markets which an organisation could use to its advantage, versus insight singular, the body of accumulated knowledge which insight and research teams developed on key customer segments, markets or channels. Within the bank there was at that time an expectation that all our analytic resource would focus on new projects, but I had already seen that much of the value came from identifying key facts from a range of sources and projects and using them to develop proactive, comprehensive, evidence-based views of the key challenges and opportunities available to the bank. Inspired by the report, I encourage Barclays to join the Insight Management Forum, um, a peer group network led by Steve Wills and Sally Webb, um, and which was created really to, to leverage the best practice thinking that they were doing. And I embarked on a 10-year crusade to transform Barclays Insight capability. We brought customer analysis and market research into the same team and added competitor intelligence. We created new roles, insight managers, to focus on the aggregation of data and project findings so that each piece of analysis we did stopped being a standalone investigation of a distinct topic and instead became one part of a joined up insight plan designed to fill the gaps in our knowledge which we needed to address in order to solve key business issues. We thought long and hard about the linkages in our work, looking for the connections between value creation, customer behavior, the drivers of that behavior, be they habits, values, attitudes or circumstances, and the wider macro environment in which consumer dilemmas were created and solved. And we ha invested heavily in an insight communications program, considering the content, audiences and channels for delivering our messages so that we could tell compelling stories tailored to the needs of many different stakeholder groups, from a chief executive to an individual branch manager. All this gave Barclays Insight team far greater traction and allowed us to grow a function full of talent, technical ability and commercial awareness, skilled in bringing multiple skills to solve business problems. But if the Insight Management and Communication Report influenced me 10 years back and many other heads of Insight at that moment in time, what will the next 10 years bring in terms of organisational decision making and the Insight teams, internal or external, which will help organisations use knowledge for competitive advantage? On Wednesday the 9th of September, this was the subject of a debate for 20 client-side Insight directors from organisations like eBay, Waitrose, Camelot, Dixon's Carphone and Transport for London, who gathered in London with a dozen of the UK's most progressive market research agencies at the Insight Management, Insight Management Academy's annual conference. 
The meeting was complemented by guest speakers from Sainsbury's, Booper, Unilever and DVL Smith and also benefited from over 150 hours of preparatory research with organisations as diverse as Metro Bank and the Police Complaints Commission and senior figures in the world of research like Crispin Beale, Simon Liddington, Ray Pointer and Phyllis McFarlane and corporate leaders as senior as Diana Oppenheimer, the former chief executive of Barclays and now a non-executive director of Tesco and AXA. The desk research and interviews had highlighted a series of transformational themes like the omnipresence of big data and passive data sources which can now seem to give organisations access to customers' views without the need for market research and traditional analysis. The danger that existing insight teams might be bypassed by IT and data technicians who have developed seductive yet sometimes superficial views of the world for data junkie chief executives. Advanced infographics and the notions of partnership strategies facilitated self-service and facilitated discovery. And far greater acceptance of the need for commercial and consultative skills and insight teams with stakeholder management and storytelling as highly prized as technical skills and research. The discussion on the day itself developed those themes and examined the drivers of change for the insight profession with a focus on eight key developments that would either affect insight professionals themselves or the broader decision-making environments in which and for which insight is generated, communicated and applied. The first of these was speed. Developments in communication in particular have led to quicker changes in culture and consumer behaviour and organisations are having to move faster to respond. So this leads, I think, to a need for insight teams to act with increased agility to find solutions such as greater emphasis on core knowledge that inform decisions without the need for further work, but also faster methods for getting additional information when that is needed. The second driver was time. So as consumers are bombarded by ever more channels and the world gets faster, decision makers equally get swamped with emails and develop lower attention spans, and that creates a problem for insight teams. It also leads then to an implication for them, an implication to focus on cut through. Insight teams need to look at how their organisations can better reach their customers, but teams themselves must improve their impact with stakeholders equally by getting more cut through. Technology was the third driver of change. Endless improvements in software, hardware, devices and channels for both consumers and people at work. And the implication here is that insight teams and suppliers need to focus on harnessing and keeping up with that new technology more effectively. That could be better analytics tools and better delivery systems uh, for self-serve and access. Data was the fourth theme, as I'm sure has been discussed a lot this morning already. The increased volume, variety and velocity of data and the vastly increased operational data drawn from digital processing has encouraged organisations to shift focus from understanding motivation to analysing behaviour, sometimes real time. In response, I think insight teams need to focus on integration, distilling insight from ever wider sources in a timely way and showing the value that multiple sources can bring to an individual business problem. The fifth theme was globalisation. Large companies are getting larger, a trend that's likely to continue for the foreseeable future. But also small companies are ever more likely to operate internationally and globally now. So insight teams need to have more understanding of different cultures and a focus on understanding both customers in different countries and colleagues as they seek to drive insight-driven change in multiple territories. The sixth focus was on behavioural economics. Technically nothing new here maybe because human nature hasn't changed, but for a variety of reasons behavioural economics is suddenly achieving great cut through at the highest level in government, finance and commerce. And insight teams and suppliers need to ride that wave Classic insight skills are needed more than ever, but ironically have never quite made the breakthrough and the profile that behavioural economics now has at some levels in government, and we really do need to exploit that opportunity. Location was the seventh theme. Ways of working are changing, globalisation demands more remote working, but also more and more people are now working from home or from multiple locations, and that changes the way that information is created, shared and consumed within companies. Insight teams must focus on collaboration skills, never understanding, not never underestimating the power of face-to-face -face working, of course, and the way that any kind of distance in terms of geography or time zone changes working patterns and changes the way in which we need to deliver our insights to key stakeholders. 
And finally, we have hierarchy. So the balance between centralized control and distributed matrix working is shifting. But on this one, I think there's no real certainty about where it's going to end. For insight, there's the prospect of chief data officers and big central teams on the one hand versus the distribution of information so that stakeholders generate and control their own insight on the other. In that environment, the focus has to be on facilitation. The more that insight shifts into the hands of users, the greater the need for insight expertise to be distributed to ensure the best outcomes. But if I was summing up the future of insight debate that was staged by the Academy two weeks ago, and the research and the interviews that took place before it, it was that the next 10 years will present insight teams and suppliers with the greatest opportunity which they have ever enjoyed. Never before has there been so much data on consumer behaviour, and never before so much appetite within organisations to use that data for competitive advantage. But opportunity and appetite do not necessarily guarantee success, and now more than ever, insight professionals need to be aware of the need to change, to equip themselves with the knowledge and skills to embed their insight within organisations, and to focus relentlessly on the need to make sense of the world around them, to identify value and then drive change which, ironically, was the same fundamental insight which I read in the Customer Insight Management Academy's first report 10 years ago. Thank you.